It is Tuesday, May the 26th, and welcome back to Goodfellows, a Hoover Institution broadcast examining the social, economic, and geostrategic concerns in a world ever-changing due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I am Bill Whelan, a research fellow here at the Hoover Institution and the Virginia Hobbs Carpenter Fellow in Journalism. Those of you who have been watching our show for the past couple of months know the drill, but for those of you who are first-time viewers, what you're about to see is a conversation in which three Hoover Senior Fellows, we like to call them the Good Fellows, offer their unique insights into what may lie ahead in these complicated times. Now let's meet the Good Fellows, beginning with John Cochran. He's an economist in the Hoover Institution, Rosemary and Jack Anderson Senior Fellow. John's also the author of the Grumpy Economist blog, which you should bookmark as a must read. Hello, John. The big news we noticed is you got a haircut or many hairs cut. <laughs> yes. Uh, my wife spent uh, about an hour watching YouTube videos to study up. And uh, here's the here's the product, at least uh, draft Mach 1. I don't think I'm ever going back to a barber again. <laughs> Well, well done, because heaven forbid you, uh, you somehow uh, violate phase two of California laws and not going to a uh, barber shop. So well done, my friend. Coming to us live from his wilderness outpost is Neil Ferguson. Neil is a renowned historian and author, and he is the Hoover Institution's Millbank Family Senior Fellow. He's also the host of Neil Ferguson's Networld, a three-part PBS series on the intersection of social media, technology, and the spread of cultural movements. Neil, how are things at Fortress Ferguson today? Well, the Memorial Day weekend in Montana had a distinctly unusual twist. Uh, it snowed so hard I was able to go skiing on Saturday. Uh, I don't think I ever expected to go skiing on the Memorial Day weekend. So another first for uh, the plague year of 2020. Okay, well, you were in cold weather gear. Did you do it in shorts? How did you, how did you pull it off? Pretty risky to ski in shorts when there's uh, only four inches on the ground and a lot of hidden rocks. Uh, so I, I made sure I had some fairly... Uh, thick trousers on, but I, I didn't need to put on too much more. Helmet, of course, got to protect this thing. Yes, exactly. Sounds like fun. Our third and final good fellow is Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster. He is the Hoover Institution's Fawad and Michelle Ajami Senior Fellow. Prior to returning to Hoover and the West Coast existence, uh, Lieutenant General McMaster was the National Security Advisor to the President of the United States. H.R. McMaster is also the author of Battlegrounds, The Fight to Defend the Free World. It's coming out this fall, but you can pre-order it right now on Amazon. Hello, HR. I think where you are, it's ball cap weather today, right? It, it is, Bill. It's, pre, it's pretty pleasant out here in California, as you know. Great to be with everybody. I know. The great thing about California on a hot day, it still beats the East Coast because no humidity. Okay. Um, and, before we get and, into and hey, I will, I, will say, I will say to John, actually, uh, Katie used to cut my hair as well, uh, which is why I now am sporting this look. So, I mean, I think your wife might be a little bit more skilled maybe than Katie, than Katie was. <laughs> I think Beth deserves a, a straight A for that haircut. Uh, you look smarter than you've looked in years, Cochran. <laughs> I love it. So, gentlemen, the big news in my humble abode this weekend was a new arrival, not a, not a child or a pet, but a rower. Weeks ago, I ordered a water rower online, uh, one of those ridiculously expensive but really well put together structures It's made out of beautiful wood. And the way it works is you pour water into the tank in the front, the water provides resistance. And I've been doing it for the past few days and I must say it is blessed relief. Uh, I'm not a runner, it's been my way to get cardio. Uh, it got me to thinking though, what the three of you are doing for fitness. And let's start with you, John Cochran. Uh, you're a runner, aren't you? Uh, I have a long list of uh, uh, things I do like. I actually own a water rower as well, which I love. Uh, when I'm up at a lake, I have a rowing skull, a kayak, a windsurfer, <laughs> mountain bike, uh, paddle board, and uh, I fly sailplanes. My, my old hobby when I was young was flying hang gliders. You can see the picture up in the back there. Mountain bike, I forgot the mountain bike. So you give me a, a, a $5,000 worth of equipment, some danger to life and limb and cardio, and I'm ready to go. That sounds great. HR, what do you do for fitness? Well, well like many, many Americans, I have a Peloton now. And, uh, and so we all schedule time on the Peloton. And my son-in-law has, has built a, a pseudo gym in our, in our garage, uh, have an elliptical trainer and, and uh, just trying to do everything we can to stay fit. I'm going to get out on, on, a, on a bike. And then, of course, uh, the whole family likes to, likes to go for walks at different times. And luckily, we have a neighborhood that's conducive to that. So uh, we're doing our best to stay active, and and uh, we're enjoying the great weather here in California. Okay, Neil, you said you went skiing this weekend. What else does one do for exercise in Montana? Are you hiking trails, chopping wood, wrestling grizzlies? What, a, what do you do for release? Woodpeckers. 
Well, I, I, I've stopped shooting woodpeckers because I found a way of deterring them with, uh, with uh, aluminium foil, which they really don't like. And uh, oh. so I found a peaceful solution for all those Buddhists who tune into Goodfellows. Uh, no more woodpeckers being shot at. The hiking is the thing that always uh, got me going as a, as a young boy. My father was a passionate believer in hiking and would go for walks in the Scottish hills, regardless of the weather, which was just as well because it nearly always rained. Uh, Montana is like an improved version of Scotland where there's much less rain, the hills are beautiful and social distancing is, is built in. So we have been hiking, but the debate within the Ferguson family revolves around our vulnerability to wild animals. Uh, and my wife, uh, who perhaps having grown up in Africa has an exaggerated view of the prevalence of wild carnivorous animals is convinced that at any moment, one or other of us will be devoured by either a grizzly bear or a mountain lion, or perhaps a moose if there are any carnivorous mooses. So there's an ongoing debate about whether we dare in fact go on what I like to refer to as yomps. Yomping is a word HR will probably know. It was what the British army did in the Falklands famously. Yomping is walking fast over rough ground. I love yomping above all other things. I hate gyms, I go to them periodically. The great thing about the pandemic is I don't have to go to the gym anymore. And it's such a relief because they're just miserable. It's torture. Hiking is so much better for you spiritually as well. You have great ideas when you're hiking. You get to think, whereas in gym, you just spend the whole time looking at your watch thinking, when will this hell end? So the pandemic's liberated me from American self-torturing uh, uh, in gymnasiums. And from now on, I'm just going to yomp my way to fitness or to death in the clutches of Grizzly. Uh, gentlemen, we've spent a lot of time uh, in the past two months talking about uh, the US and China and the uh, fragile relationship, if there is indeed still a relationship going on there. Uh, I think it's a good opportunity to uh, switch our focus this week to another part of the world, uh, specifically Europe. And I want to look at the situation involving the European Union, if we think that union is going to last. Uh, the EU, for those not familiar, it's a 27-nation alliance that this November will have been uh, in existence for 27 years. Uh, right now, it is trying to figure out how to put together a COVID relief package uh, on which all members do not agree. There is a question moving forward of the EU's finances, especially if and when a Brexit deal is negotiated. There's also a question of how the EU is going to pay for its European Green New Deal, um, the grand vision of transforming Europe into a low carbon economy. And if that's not enough, there is also the question of who is going to be leading the EU in a few years from now, if indeed Angela Merkel makes good on her pledge not to seek a fifth term as Germany's chancellor. So HR, I know you've been watching Europe. Uh, why don't you start the conversation with your thoughts on where Europe is moving ahead? Well, I'd just like to begin by saying, I think that a strong Europe is in America's interests, as is a strong transatlantic relationship. And what we've seen Europe go through is, is really a, trying to figure out what is the European idea and how to act on the European idea in a way that preserves the sovereignty of, Euro of Europe's citizens. And I think what you're going to see sort out post-Brexit and then post-COVID is, is how Europeans define their own sovereignty. And I believe it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to, to ensure that the EU does what, it was, what, it's, what the European people intended to do. And, and I think what you're going to see is a, a reinforcement of, of the idea that, that that strength of our free and open societies broadly comes from strong sovereign states and citizens who have a say in, in how they're governed. And, and, uh, and so I, I think that this could be an opportunity, I think, to, uh, to, to redefine Europe. I think that you have the tension, obviously, and, and, uh, and, and Neil and, and John are going to be much better suited to, to comment on this, uh, be, you know, between the, you know, the north and the south and the east and the west within the European Union. And you have, the, you have just in this past week, uh, the, the decision by France and, and Germany uh, to, to underwrite a, a great deal of the fiscal stimulus in, in Europe. And I think also that now you see really a, a sharpening, a sharpening of the competition uh, between, between China and it should be all free and open societies post-COVID. So it's a very dynamic time. I mean, I, Europe has a special place in my heart. You know, I lived in the, in the UK, but I, I lived in Germany for six and a half years and had the privilege of patrolling the east-west German border near Coburg, Germany, where Martin Luther translated the Bible into German. 
and and also the birthplace of Hans Morgenthau. So, I mean, I, 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 I had the opportunity to patrol that border when East Germany lifted travel restrictions to the West and got to witness the parting of the Iron Curtain. And when from one moment our cavalry troopers were staring down East German border guards, uh, the next moment uh, those, those, those gates were thrown open and then uh, tens and then hundreds and then thousands and then tens of thousands of East Germans poured across that border and, and, uh, and, and they you know, showered our, our soldiers with bouquets of, of flowers and bottles of wine. There were hugs and tears of joy. And, and it was just a, a, a tremendous moment when freedom triumphed uh, over, uh, over autocracy. Uh, and, and, um, and so I, I, I have a special place in my heart for Europe. And I believe a strong Europe is in, uh, is in America's interests as well. Neil, maybe you can help explain to the audience exactly how the EU operates, how these 27 nations interact, who, who drives the operation, and what the various concerns are when it comes to trying to cobble together a COVID package. Well, in the first of my 10 lectures on this subject, I'll try to cover the uh, <laughs> most obvious points. No, to be honest, uh, as HR was talking, I was remembering my own time as uh, as a young European, uh, because after all, that's what I was back in 1989. I'd been studying in Germany. I'd uh, been in Berlin much of that year, though I wasn't there the night that the Berlin Wall came down. And I think I had a very similar response to HRs to that extraordinary moment uh, of, uh, of reunification that, that became possible. Uh, and it had seemed impossible to most people just a short time before the collapse of the Iron Curtain. That was one of the high points of my life. I'd studied European history uh, as an undergraduate and had decided uh, while at Oxford that I wanted to study German history because it still seemed to me that the central question of modern history was the German problem. Why had the most technologically advanced and economically successful of all the European economies by the time you got to, to the 1920s gone so abysmally wrong in the 1930s and 1940s? Why had the best educated uh, of the European elites ended up uh, conniving at uh, the world's most ghastly crime, uh, the Holocaust? That for me was the big question. That's really why I became a historian, to understand the great mid-century crisis, uh, and Germany was at its center. So uh, the answer to the question that, that you asked is really a, a historical question. In the ruins of Europe in 1945, an idea that had been tried before, it had been called the pan-European movement in the 1920s, was resuscitated, but given a kind of makeover uh, by uh, rather more pragmatic uh, Europeans than had, uh, than had been the founders of pan-Europeanism. And the, the great insight of uh, Schumann and Monet was that you were going to make economics the driving force rather than some lofty ideal of European federalism. From the outset uh, with the European coal and steel community, the goal was economic integration in the belief that the political hearts and minds would follow if you could only make the economics work. And I think it's a mistake to think of the European Union as something that just came into existence with the Treaty of Maastricht in the 1990s. It was really something that grew from the 1950s organically, enlarging itself, especially uh, after the fall of, uh, of the Iron Curtain, but it had been enlarging itself before. It did enlarge itself in the 1970s when my country of birth, the United Kingdom, joined. And at each stage in that process, uh, people were told that this would be economically advantageous. Uh, British voters in 1973 were told that this was a common market that they were joining, that that was really the point of it, that it would help Britain out of its post-war economic difficulties. And I think that that conversation began to change around about the 1990s, because for two reasons, the, the conversation uh, became about politics. First of right. all, uh, it started to be an explicitly federalist project. The goal was to create a European Union, and it was that that uh, that rebranding that I think sent alarm bells ringing in many uh, British heads. 
Uh, once we were no longer in, in the European economic community, but in a European Union, the goal of which was ever closer union, uh, then you knew that actually you'd signed up for something that wasn't purely economic. Uh, secondly, uh, the grand design of monetary union became central to the project. Once again, uh, and this was very clear in Jacques Delors' famous plan for monetary union, the goal was to do something economic that would necessarily have political consequences whether people liked them or not. By having a monetary union, uh, I think that was the vision, you would kind of force people closer to a federal political outcome. I think from that moment, the minute they decided on that, Britain's exit was only a matter of time. Now, looking back four years ago, I was against Brexit at that point because it seemed to me mm -hmm. politically far from uh, to Britain's advantage to, to leave the EU then. But in truth, I'd always been more of a Eurosceptic at heart. I'd been very against the monetary union. I still think it was a dreadful mistake. And I still think that Europe is, is really uh, facing difficult consequences that were inherent in that project. Most obviously, you've got a monetary union without any real fiscal union. And that means that there's a ticking time bomb at the heart of Europe called the Italian debt. And this is really a way of cueing John Cochrane, because if there's one person who can really help us think about this, it's John. It's still in the end an economic project. It stands or falls on its economic success. And I don't think that they've done anything yet, despite recent news stories, to solve the fundamental problem that Europe has a monetary union, but no fiscal union, and is therefore an inherently unstable entity. Sorry, long answer, but you asked a question that really required 10 lectures to be fully answered. All right, John Cocker, and that's your cue to explain the finances. Well, uh, I'm, I'm going to also take uh, abuse the privilege of a slightly longer answer, and then we'll get into uh, monetary and fiscal union. Uh, I also am, am a big Europhile. Uh, I spent uh, five years of my youth in the 1970s in Italy, though I was mostly patrolling Piazza Santa Croce trying to meet Italian girls rather than the, uh, the uh, Eastern <laughs> NATO. So I can't claim that much patriotism uh, uh, for that one. Um, but it did, uh, Italy in the 1970s was uh, a perpetual, I thought the word crisis or crisi in Italian just meant the normal state of affairs because every day the newspaper had, oh, the crisis of this, the crisis of that. It's a time of swiftly depreciating lira, uh, everything going wrong. And um, it, also traveling around Europe, I kind of wondered why isn't this all one country? So I, I am a big uh, Europhile. Uh, it sounds like even uh, a good deal more than Neil uh, on this one. Uh, part of your question, you know, will the euro last, is do you think the euro should last? <laughs> we all put our, our forecast where our hopes are. And I definitely think the euro should last, the European Union should last, and the euro as a currency union. Uh, it's perfectly fine to have a currency union without a banking union, uh, without a banking union. The open banking would be very helpful. You do not need fiscal union to have a currency union, you just need the agreement that as uh, all of us default, if we can't pay our debts, so countries default, they don't get bailed out by printing money. That, that's perfectly possible to have currency union without fiscal union. The US is supposed to be set up that way. We're about to find out if we are or not. Uh, and so, I, but we'll, well, I think we'll debate that one a little more as, as we get to it and what to do about that current situation. One more general comment. So I, like Neil back then, was, was for not for Brexit. My, my motto was fix it, don't Brexit. Um, Europe got to a state, I think, parallel to the U.S. under the Articles of Confederation. We knew we wanted to be some sort of federated group of independent states, but we didn't know quite what that meant. And very clearly, the system that had been put together needed fundamental reform. Uh, it wasn't exactly the way the Articles of Confederation worked, uh, but there was, there was a large um, bureaucracy in Brussels full of all sorts of ideas, which drove the Brits nuts. Um, rightfully so, uh, and, uh, and not accountable politically as, as it should have been. Nobody really pays attention to their European Union congressmen the way we pay attention to our congressmen. It needed a different package. It needed a, 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 the moment of the constitution when we sat down and said, okay, Articles of Confederation ain't working. Uh, we need something different. What is this arrangement between sovereign countries? Uh, that I, I think should be a little closer to political union than it sounds like Neil does, uh, definitely economic union. 
uh, but not uh, the vision we seem to be going to is this technocracy from Brussels that will uh, tax German and French uh, taxpayers to send rivers of money south on who knows what project. We're talking all about how much money will be, will be sent to help, but not what any of that money is going to do. Uh, the technocracy will put it in its mind that it needs to, uh, having ruined Germans, Germany's energy economy, will now uh, embark on a climate project for all of Europe, stuffing it down their throats. This is exactly the sort of thing that drives Brexiteers to Brexiting. Uh, so certainly, they, I like a European Union, but they need to think, and we'll talk more about what is the right relationship between states and, and central government. John, I wonder if and let me I just jump in just before you Europe go has not further, because been, in fact we have to face Europe has not been the wild economic success that was promised. Uh, free trade uh, is supposed to bring us great stuff, and Europe has not been growing like crazy. So there's there's reason to that. Okay, so now let's talk about. I know this is where, where Neil wants to jump in. Let's talk about the issues uh, which you brought up. Uh, are we going to borrow a ton of money uh, to hand it to send it down south? Who is going to pay for that if we do? Uh, are we going to have euro bonds without the European Union levying taxes? That's the US deal. The US federal government sends stuff, that's Hamilton's deal. Uh, we, send, we, we can spend, but we have the ability to tax and we have the accountability for that taxation. Europe's trying to send money and hasn't figured that out. Okay, so we brought them up. Neil, you wanna go and then we can uh, talk more about these issues. Well, yeah, this is kind of where it gets a little technical, but I think it's worth our while getting the technicalities right. Uh, there was a very heated debate in the immediate aftermath of the pandemic striking Europe about, about whether or not Europe was actually responding in an adequate way. And in truth, in February, March, when Italy was in uh, deep trouble with uh, its ov hospitals overwhelmed, uh, it seemed as if sauve qui peut was the uh, organizing principle, every man for himself. Uh, there were reports that Germany was withholding medical supplies uh, from Italy. Uh, the, the mood was extremely bitter, and I think some Italians will take a long time to forget what happened then. Uh, once Germany felt that it had the situation in Germany under control, uh, Angela Merkel, uh, the long-serving chancellor, began making speeches about Europe as a community of fate. Eine Schicksalsgemeinschaft, a wonderful German word. That's the kind of thing you say as a German leader once you've sorted out the German problem. And then we ended up having a debate about how exactly to help Italy. Were there going to be corona bonds? Were there going to be special instruments for the purposes of, of funding relief? Well, they finally came up with the solution uh, just last week. Uh, between them, uh, Angela Merkel and the French president, the charismatic uh, Emmanuel Macron. And the solution was that the European Union was going to have uh, an economic recovery fund of 500 billion euros that would be funded with the sale of European Union bonds. And the funds would then be transferred to those regions, notice, not countries, regions, most hard hit by the pandemic. Uh, since the announcement of this plan, the usual suspects uh, have complained that it's actually uh, at odds with the uh, European rules. The Dutch uh, in pole position are uh, leading the frugal four. My suspicion is that their opposition will not stop this from happening. But here's the crux of the matter. Does it really help matters? Is it a Hamilton moment? If meanwhile, uh, the bulk of tax raising and borrowing capacity remains with the member states. And meanwhile, Italy still has an unsustainable national debt problem uh, that isn't, I think, going to be solved by the transfers from this new European uh, recovery fund. That's the really key question. And I think if things go wrong in Italy, suppose the government falls, suppose Matteo Salvini, the Donald Trump of Italian politics, uh, comes to power, suppose the markets then suddenly take fright at uh, Italy's ability to manage its own debt or don't believe that the European Central Bank can really backstop uh, the Italian debt, then I think all this recent stuff counts for nothing because it doesn't really address the fundamental problem of Italy's nasty uh, fiscal arithmetic, which can only really get nastier given that Italian growth must be negative this year. And, uh, and, and all you really need is to have a higher real rate on your debt 
than your real growth rate to encounter some very nasty fiscal arithmetic. That, that I think, is the crux of the matter. Uh, and I think all hinges in that sense on, on Italian political stability. Uh, and, and in the end, uh, I don't know, frankly, if this government uh, uh, is going to go the distance. Not many Italian governments do historically. So let, let me just chime in with agreeing. I, I think this is a not a well thought out plan, if we can put it politely. What are we going to do with the 500 million euros, uh, 500 billion euros? Sorry, uh, we've talked about where it goes, but um, you know, we're just handing out money. Second, is this a senior or junior to existing Italian debt? This is the problem we're facing in the U.S. on a much smaller scale. Uh, California, Illinois, Connecticut are are they're just cratering fiscally. Uh, the federal government wants to help people in the U.S., which involves sending people check checks. Uh, we want to help the governments to provide new services, but we don't want to bail them out of their own debts. And that's exactly, you know, they're trying to square this circle of how do you help Italy without bailing out the existing Italian debt, or can you? Um, I, I think you're exactly right. We're heading for that Italian debt crisis. And it's, it's, it, I don't see how you can separate the handing out of lots and lots of new money from the bailing out of old debts. Uh, a clearer picture of what we were going to do with this money and how it was going to help I think would would uh, make a big difference. Uh, and you're exactly right. The, you're, right now, the system has been the European Central Bank is buying up sovereign debts to try to keep the debt crisis from coming, to try to have us stop us from having Greece on an enormous scale with Italy. And that's running into its final brick wall. The German court uh, said, I'm sorry, you're not allowed to do this anymore. That's not what the European Central Bank was set up to do. To, to, that was supposed to be a uh, do what it takes for the short run about 10 years ago. Well, <laughs> here we are, and, and we still haven't solved the problem of the ECB being the one buying up uh, sovereign debts of, uh, of Italy and other countries. Bill, I, I wonder if I can pivot back to HR uh, with a question. I always feel that there's a, a bit of sleight of hand when Americans and Europeans talk about the success of the European Union because they nearly always say at some point that European integration has brought peace to Europe and therefore has a great success. And I scratch my head when I hear this and I have lost count of the number of times I've heard it because it seems to me that that's not actually attributable to the European Union. The, the one thing that Europe didn't do was integrate its defense capability. It tried to do that and then the French vetoed it all the way back in the 1960s. And so it's actually NATO that is the reason uh, that Europe has enjoyed peace uh, since 1945, uh, accepting perhaps the Balkan Wars of the 1990s. And that brings us back to you and Coburg and what you were doing there. You know, the really strange thing about much of the conversation that goes on in, in Europe today is that there's a complete uh, forgetfulness about the American contribution to Western Europe's recovery and to European unification after 1989, to the enlargement of Europe. It was all underwritten by the United States. And I just saw an opinion poll uh, last week from the Kerber Foundation in Germany that made my jaw drop because it suggested that uh, the experience of the pandemic has made Germans much more uh, hostile or unsympathetic to the United States than to China. And when yes. you ask them on which of those two countries they'd like to be closer to, the answer is, oh, we'd like to be equidistant from them if possible. Uh, yeah. This is, seems, seems like just the most monumental ingratitude. And I wonder how you, as a, as a military man who served in uh, Germany, feel about this strange vein of anti-Americanism that has crept into, uh, well, more than crept into, it's been a feature of German politics now for quite a while. But what's your thinking on that? And can Europe actually be a stable, peaceful uh, continent without an American military guarantee? Uh, let, me, let me jump in first before HR answers. Uh, Neil, you mentioned the poll, uh, a couple of data points from that poll. 73% of Germans say that their opinion of the US has deteriorated. And that's more than double the number who feel the same towards China. Second bullet point, only 10% of Germans, 10% of Germans consider the U.S. their closest partner in foreign policy compared to 19% who felt that way back in September. Well, I think, you know, it gets to the, the word you used from, from the very beginning. It's complacency. And I think that now there is a generation coming of age who has come of age who didn't really have to fight for their freedom. 
And I think freedom that was granted without really the, the contest that we witnessed over, over the Cold War is, is taken for granted. And I think there's also been, you know, I think running through all, all Western societies, kind of I, what I would call a streak of self-loathing that manifests itself in academia in particular. And these are those who, are, who tend to be sympathetic to the new left interpretation of history in which all of the ills of the world prior to 1945 were due to colonialism and all the ills of the world post-1945 were due to capitalist imperialism. There tends that, therefore to be a sense of moral equivalency that goes along with that. That, well, you know, these are authoritarian regimes, but look how bad, look how bad we are. And I think there's a, a loss of, of, of a sense of how important it is to preserve our democratic principles and institutions and, and processes and the advantages that that has given us and that we have to fight to preserve to, to, to bequeath to future generations. And so it, it's kind of heartbreaking for me at times to, to see it. I think that it's really, I, I think, uh, paradoxical, you know, that, that, uh, that we w would criticize, you know, criticize our, ourselves uh, more fervently than we would authoritarian and closed systems uh, such a, a, as those of, of China and, 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 uh, and also Russia. And as, as you know, that you know, Russia has been very active, you know, at least since, you know, the, the early uh, 2000s. In, in trying to break apart Europe and diminish European, the European people's the, the, uh, citizens' um, confidence uh, in, their, in their democratic principles and, and institutions. And, and, uh, and I think Russia uh, sees its own weakness and, and really is endeavoring to be the, the last man standing in, in Europe after it drags uh, everyone down with this, this uh, sustained campaign of disinformation, propaganda, and really political subversion. And what I'm concerned about is that China will also move in to take advantage of, this is where I think the fiscal crisis, it actually you know, intertwines with the geostrategic competition, is that China will view this opportunistically as a way to solidify some of, some of the business and financial relationships that are already pulling certain European countries more closely into, into China's orbit and away, and away from the United States. Now, I, could, I, don't, I don't think this competition is anywhere close to being over. I mean, and, and I believe that we have opportunities, as we talked a little bit about uh, in, the, in the last session. But I'd love to hear how, how you think we, we regain uh, a sense of, of who we are uh, and, that, and, and that, that who we are really um, are, are, are citizens of democratic, free, and open societies. And, and uh, I think a lot of that has to do with Neil, as, as you described it, the great degeneration, right? We, we have these interactions of institutions. We interact with multiple institutions. And I think what, what, one of the things we all have to take on is we have to restore our confidence in, in our institutions and in our form of governance. And uh, sorry, John, go ahead. Uh, well, I just John, wanted, so I, I think, uh, no, I, I didn't know when you're going to be done. Um, I think we're, we're forgetting how long this has been going on. Uh, this is not recent. I think really the date is 1968 to mark the change from Europe to sort of grateful and remembering America uh, and, uh, and fashionable anti-American leftism taking over. Uh, so Vietnam, uh, Vietnam is really the crucial. So certainly through the 1970s, uh, all, all of academia, but all of fashionable Europe was anti-American. Uh, and with some deeper, you know, you mentioned uh, fighting to defend democracy and, and freedom. Half of Europe in World War II was fighting to defend communism. <laughs> and, and it was a narrow thing in the 1960s uh, where Europe was going to end up with that. Um, so it's been going on a long time. And I, I certainly think the, the Russian, the communist threat uh, was much stronger in the 70s and uh, into the early 80s than is the Chinese threat now, which is some new fangled far away thing, you know, maybe convenient if they can buy some of our bonds, but we can't stand them in lots of other ways. Uh, the force that, uh, that the European communist parties and that, that, and that fashionable leftism had in the 1970s was a lot stronger than any pro-Chinese uh, views now. But I will say America is also not helping. Uh, I, like, I think all three of us believe in a strong alliance between the US and Europe and you know, start telling them that they're not going to be able to sell Mercedes here, and starting fights over steel and things like that. We need a strong alliance with the Europeans, uh, and let's not piss off our friends. 
Hey, the one point I'll make in, in, on, on this as well as the security dimension of this, you know, I, I think we went through this period of complacency in the 90s in particular, when the Soviet Union had collapsed, Russia was reeling, the financial crisis in 98 in Russia, for example, was weak in Russia even further. China was, was, was growing uh, at, at, at very high rates, but was, but was nowhere near a competitor. Uh, with with the United States or, or Europe. And so great power competition was over. And I think there was a belief that this arc of history had guaranteed the primacy of free and open societies over closed authoritarian systems. The security dimension of this was significant. We were reaping the peace dividend. Uh, you, <laughs> European militaries, I mean, dismantled themselves uh, in, in large measure uh, in, in the 1990s. And, and we disengaged from European security, even well after the 2007 denial of service attacks against Estonia, even well after the invasion of Georgia in, in 2008, we, we, we continued on the same path, despite what should have been you know, harbingers of what was coming next. And, and so we've been slow to respond. Now, I think with the, you know, with the, the, the Wales pledges of, of, you know, of, of uh, 4% of, of GDP and so forth being allocated toward, uh, toward defense, uh, is, is, those, are, those are important. Uh, pledges or two is that two percent? I think it is. we're four. I wish it were four HR. Yeah, Unfortunately, no, it's uh, it's yeah, uh, it's half that, and it's very right. unlikely that any uh, of the really big European countries will get there. The Greeks, plucky Greeks, uh, fulfill their NATO uh, obligations, but the Germans are far short yeah. of that. 2%. And the, and the, and the polls, is nothing historically. And the, and the polls have the Brits have Ger Germany is the is the issue here. I think, and Germany is is. Has to, it has to be at the heart, I think, Let's of the transatlantic it. relationship. And, and you know, they're, they're spending 1% of their GDP on, on defense. The and, China, I'm it, sorry. You waste a lot of money on defense. The threat from China is different than the threat from, the threat from the Soviet Union was. Europe wants to do business with China. They want to buy, they want to buy stuff cheap. They want to take some money. There, there's no one wandering around. If there was more Mao books uh, in, in, in the 1970s, nobody believes in the Chinese model and, and we need to be like China, the, you know, the way the communist parties did in the 1960s. Time so, out, time out, uh, Professor kind of Cochran. There's China. another poll that's that, that would, threat, would that's there's that's another that. poll that might, might, I think, change your mind. If you uh, look back to before the pandemic, uh, our colleague Timothy Garden ash was conducting some research on uh, uh, the attitudes of young Europeans uh, to politics, and a very striking finding uh, was. I have the, it, Neil, Neil. I have it. If you want me to read the data points, Bill, I'm happy to cue you. Yeah, the the data on on the attitudes of young people towards democracy versus authoritarianism when it comes to climate change, Bill. All right. So Neil mentioned this is a study done for the uh, Dorendorf program for the study of freedom at the European Studies Center, St. Anthony's College, University of Oxford. Uh, they uh, surveyed 12,000 respondents ages 16 to 69 in all 27 EU member states. Uh, I'm going to give you four data points here. Number one, 84% of Europeans support an EU proposal for mandatory minimum wage. Two, 71% of Europeans support the introduction of a universal basic income, the UBI. Three, 53% of young Europeans, 53% of young Europeans place more confidence in authoritarian states than democracies when it comes to addressing the climate. Bullet point number four, only 43% of Europeans are rather confident about the next generation's job security. Let's be clear what this means. Uh, so Europeans, that, that uh, whatever percent it was who want authority, they don't want Chinese authoritarians. They want Greta Thunberg authoritarians to take over. And there is a strong, uh, they call themselves eco-authoritarian movement that says the climate is going to, the world is going to end in 11 years, uh, six months and two days. We don't have time to waste for democracy. We have to take over and shove it down their throats. But there's a big difference in Greta Thunberg and, and, and the Chinese uh, Communist Party. And they certainly are not looking for the Chinese Communist Party to run things, that blessed heaven of wonderful clean air Beijing. Well, I think just to to push back a little that what you may be missing, John, is the extent to which the Chinese uh, have successfully used propaganda to represent themselves as green uh, uh, as compared with the United States. After all, remember the debates that went on around the time of the Paris Climate Accord. The Chinese are pretty good at virtue signaling. Uh, we're not so good at it. And so they've actually been able to give a good many people in Europe the impression that they're the ones 
who actually are investing in electronic cars and actually are investing in clean energy. We know that it's all a lie and that the Chinese are building more coal-fueled uh, power stations than the rest of the world put together. But Chinese propaganda's got better, and we've seen that during the COVID-19 pandemic. The Chinese, despite obviously being responsible for this disaster, having mismanaged things so badly in Wuhan in December and January, have pivoted to a new narrative in which they're actually the saviors of mankind, uh, and they made a big play of dispensing aid to Italy uh, and other European countries, Spain, in the form of masks and ventilators uh, at the worst point in the pandemic. So I think there is a distinct risk that the way the Chinese play this uh, gets interpreted by young anti-American uh, Europeans as, in fact, complementary to their own ambitions. And that's the reason that I, I do have some concerns. It's not, not the same as it was when you were wandering around trying to pick up uh, young Italian uh, maidens. Uh, things have definitely changed. There isn't a bunch of card-carrying uh, commie professors. Uh, at least there aren't many of them left. That's not oh, actually, the problem. There's a lot of them left, but that's another... I'm, I'm, I'm actually more concerned about the way in which young Europeans in their preoccupation with climate are ready to jettison democracy. And by the way, this isn't the only poll that's found this. Uh, uh, Yashka Monk, who used to be at Harvard, and we briefly overlap before he went on to Johns Hopkins, published some very uh, similar data uh, a couple of years ago, showing just the extent to which environmental absolutism is decoupling young Europeans from democracy. That's the kind of thing that the Chinese are, and the Russians are very well able to exploit. No, I, th I think you're exactly right. That is the danger is a homegrown authoritarian, the Green parties, the left parties, and the left in the US is extraordinarily authoritarian. It's about keep taking power and keeping power and shoving it down your throats. Uh, maybe they'll ally in some sense with China. They're certainly not going to import Chinese authoritarian. But right. looks like I, I, think, China. I think we do have a tremendous advantage. And that tremendous advantage is Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party leadership. I think what they're doing is providing a great deal of clarity right now on the contrast between and their authoritarian closed system and, and our free and open societies and, and the, ben the benefit of our, of our free and, and open societies. And I think what we have to do is allow them to demonstrate themselves by pointing it out. And I, I'm thinking of last week, uh, the, the European uh, Union ambassador, uh, when he allowed uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party to, uh, to edit uh, a letter that he published in, in, the, in the Chinese press or what passes as the Chinese press. He was chastised for, for Brussels, from Brussels. But, but what I think was interesting about it is exactly what Neil said. I mean, the Chinese Communist Party portrays itself as an upholder of, 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 uh, of international norms and, 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 and efforts on, on climate change and renewable energy, when it does exactly the opposite. And what was interesting is, is in this letter, it said, well, we really need to cooperate with China, which is actually playing right into their, pro in, in the, into their story, into, into the Chinese Communist Party story. But all the areas that, that were listed as areas of cooperation are areas where the Chinese Communist Party is actively undermining the international order for, and, and, uh, and you know, so-called you know, global governance. Uh, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> climate is one of them. And uh, as Neil said, and we all know, I mean, they are poisoning the planet. Uh, with uh, with uh, with coal fired plants in in particular, I mean all of all of the coal fired plants that are under construction in Africa, for example, are Chinese financed, Chinese built. Uh, one of them, for example, in Kenya is gonna, is, gonna, is right next to a UNESCO World Heritage Site and will be the largest polluter um, in 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 Kenya once it's it's completed. Uh, China talks a good game about really cleaning up their, their, their you know the the, uh, the the air quality, but all they're doing is moving those coal plants out to the countryside. And guess where all those particles are drifting over you know, to California. <laughs> and so uh, I, I, think they, I think that the, on health was another area that we have to cooperate. We know that they had actively undermined the World Health uh, or Organization. We can't get flight data about where flights left from Wuhan and where, and where they landed because China is, is, is control of ICAO, the, the International Civil Aviation uh, Organization. I mean, the, the undermining of the, the UN Human Rights Council to, to the degree that it's, it's just a complete farce and we had to, we had to walk away from it. So, so I, I just think that this is a moment of clarity 
we have Xi Jinping to thank for it, and, and we ought to use it. And, and John, you know, as you mentioned, I mean, the best way to counter China is not to shoot our allies, right? I mean, and so, so this is what, what it was difficult for me to understand, is if you're going to confront Chinese unfair trade and economic practices, tariffs on, you know, on, on European steel and aluminum just didn't seem to, to fit into that. So we've had, we have administered some foot shots, but I think there's a very high degree of international cooperation going on. And with our European partners in particular, I think there's been, there's been some unprecedented actions below the, you know, the noise level of, of, uh, of, of uh, insults back and forth and so forth across the Atlantic. I think there's unprecedented cooperation on the threat from uh, Chinese unfair trade and economic practices, for, for example. And, and, uh, and, uh, and I, th- I think that we're going to see even more of that cooperation uh, we, in, the, in the coming years. Before we restart the, the old fight about whether there's such a thing as unfair trade, which will put our listeners to sleep, I, wanna, I want both of you guys, because you are very good at, at thinking far forward. On the climate issue, um, as we know, climate started as a technocratic sort of bipartisan thing. There's a problem. Carbon tax is this way to fit it. And then it got mixed into an enormous uh, extreme left political agenda. Um, you know, Greta Thunberg herself started on climate, but now you can't fix the climate unless you have climate justice and social justice and fix the patriarchy and the remedy colonialism and universal income for all people and a guaranteed job and the whole business got wound up into climate. Uh, and that is the political, almost religious movement that is motivating in your inner poll that was motivating uh, young Europeans. Um, that took a hiatus for a couple months during this pandemic, and I sort of see signs of it trying to revive again. Our own home institution, Stanford, by the way, just announced a school of sustainability. A school is a, is a organization on the level of the law school, the business school, the entire faculty of arts and sciences. We are now to have an entire one devoted to sustainability of climate, to inculcate climate values in everything around Stanford. It's just a local example of this movement revving up again. Do you think that there will be, so we have all been thinking, hey, uh, COVID ought to wake us up. There are some big present dangers uh, that society needs to face, war, nuclear war, pandemic, bioterrorism, and that perhaps um, climate should go back to being a a serious issue, but a technocratic issue not wound up with a political cause. Do you see back to things as usual that this alignment of climate with the other uh, sort of left-wing agenda stays intact or does that lose its resonance uh, after a year or so of this pandemic going on? Well, I think the European politics is interesting here because even as uh, many young Europeans are drawn towards green parties and, and it seems even uh, uh, as if they'll become parties of government in Germany as well as in Austria. There is a countervailing trend uh, towards the right. Uh, now, conventionally in the United States, we think that generational politics is quite simple, that older people are conservative and younger people are, are progressive, but that's not actually true in Europe. Uh, you'll find that the Front National's successor uh, organization, the, the right-wing party in France, is actually attracting support from younger voters. The Italian right-wing Liga has a significant uh, amount of support from the young. And the further east you go, the more true this is, so that when you get to Poland and Hungary, actually the right has a very strong support from the young. So I I think that we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that populism in Europe is not quite like populism uh, in uh, the United States. And although populism has suffered suffered a setback during uh, the pandemic, in, in most, though not all countries, my guess is that it'll it'll make a comeback once it sinks in just how dire the economic situation is in some of the countries in europe i think the german case is interesting because germany's probably going to do okay the interesting thing is that of all the countries that are trying to reopen and restart their economies germany is in pole position look at the restaurant data the germans are actually according to the open table data the people who are most back to dining out Uh, germany not only handled the pandemic well it's now doing really large-scale stimulus 
which it didn't do back in 2008-9 to get its economy restarted. Actually, in some estimates, Germany is doing the biggest fiscal stimulus of any major economy. And I think it's going to be very interesting if that doesn't trickle down to the rest of Europe. If Germany has a strong recovery and there isn't much spillover to the other European countries, then I think the populist sentiment that's already very discernible in Italy, the sense of disillusionment with Europe is going to grow. Salvini is going to come to power. He's a formidable politician. I've met him. In many ways, he's the most impressive of the European populists when it comes to working the crowd. With Salvini in power in Rome, and I think that could happen uh, sometime in the next couple of years, I, I think the whole nature of European politics will change. And there'll be a real friction between the virtue signaling technocrats in Brussels, led by the German Ursula von der Leyen, appointed essentially by Angela Merkel to lead the commission, and populist governments in southern and eastern Europe that will be saying, screw all this, where are our jobs? So that seems like the kind of fracture that I could imagine opening up in Europe over the next few years. But you know, but I think what we should try to do at, at Hoover and and uh, and as we look at these problem sets is to is to not cede any any uh, any of these issues to the far left, you know, or, or to the far right for for that matter. You know, for climate, like many other issues, I mean, there there are facts that we can all just agree on, right? Can we agree that climate change is happening? Can we agree that it's man made? And can we agree that it's bad? <laughs> and that we should and we should also agree that you know we can no longer conscience, you know, non-solutions to this problem, like the, the Green New Deal. And so what's happened is the debate on this just moves to polar extremes between climate deniers and Green New Dealers. Well, well you know, there's, there's enough in the middle. Okay, so the greatest, the greatest reduction of greenhouse emissions ever achieved was achieved through the free market in the United States as a result of fracking and the availability of cheap natural gas, right? And, and we, we, we know that that could, is a huge element of, 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 this, uh, of the solution to this. And what is needed because China, India, and soon Africa are going to poison the world is that we need solutions that are applicable beyond the you know, developed economies and that are aligned with economic incentives. The technologies, by the way, exist for many of these solutions now. Uh, unfortunately, Germany threw one of them out, which is nuclear power next generation nuclear power, for example. But there are these interconnected problems, right, of, of, of climate and, and energy and environment. It, it affects food and water security and agricultural techniques. Technologies are now available that could allow us to make tremendous progress. I think what we ought to do is put forward real solutions instead of non-solutions. And, and, and one of the projects we might undertake is, is to help some of these solutions succeed in India, which is a country that the world needs to succeed because even given the scale of, of India, even small problems in India are big world problems, you know? So uh, I, I, think that, I think there are opportunities here for, you know, for, for, uh, for, for real solutions on climate and we shouldn't cede that debate, right? To the, to the extremes. So we, we <laughs> have been saying this for a long time but uh, you, you know, a, a large, maybe 40% of the political force here and in Europe has invested itself for 20 years on denying what you just said. So that, uh, you know, will, will Stanford Sustainability School ever talk about nuclear power, geoengineering, genetically modified foods, which produce foods with a whole lot less carbon. Um, uh, yes, uh, uh, fracking as a transition fuel, any of the sort of, can, can you can you say climate is this problem and also dissociate that climate in order to fix the climate we don't have to fix capitalism and we don't have to fix inequality i mean those maybe are issues but what you were talking about is sort of the the technocratic center in which we like to live but that's not the political center of the, the left has really constructed an entire narrative around uniting all of those things that you just say well we can just tear those apart i think it's going to be a lot harder than you think well, yeah, and, and the whole the whole cultural thing too of Neil and is this whole cultural thing of like we had our industrial revolution, right? So we should now you know pay uh, for for that, and, and so it's this whole punitive aspect of it as well. I mean, I, I think there ought to be measures like that, that ought to look at carbon emissions in relation to GDP. I think is a much better measure, for example, uh, than some of the measures that are used. But Neil, sorry, I didn't mean to didn't mean to cut you off. 
Not at all. I was just looking back on January when Greta Thunberg was being fated at the World Economic Forum. And she gave a speech in which she said emphatically that it wasn't enough to reduce emissions. There had to be zero uh, emissions and that, that there needed to be a large scale closure of manufacturing to achieve that goal. And uh, everybody applauded. And I was listening to it thinking, why are they clapping? This is crazy. Well, one of the few benefits of COVID-19 is that it has delivered uh, Greta Thunberg's uh, wish. Uh, it has fulfilled it because there was a drastic reduction in manufacturing activity uh, in most of the major economies of the world. And a nice paper that I looked at the other day uh, showed just how dramatically that reduced uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, skies cleared over China uh, back at the height of the, the, the epidemic there. Uh, of course, it also meant that uh, unemployment uh, soared to Great Depression levels. And I think this might be a teachable moment uh, when we say, yes, uh, of course you can really reduce CO2 emissions drastically and fulfill Greta Thunberg's wishes by shutting down the economy and throwing a third or a quarter of the population out of work. Once you realize that that doesn't really add up as a strategy, you have some hope, I think, of of shifting the debate to the kind of solutions that you're talking about, HR. But will the new sustainability school at Stanford invite our friend Bjorn Lomberg to gov come and give a talk about his excellent new book on the trade-offs that you have to confront when you're asking questions about reducing emissions without uh, shutting down economies? My guess is that the invitation probably won't go to him and he'll have to content himself with coming occasionally to visit us at the Hoover Institution, uh, where I hope but we have uh, a, a broad, uh, an open mind on these questions, uh, and above all, a preoccupation with scientifically based solutions that are economically rational and don't inflict greater costs uh, than the benefits that they confer. You know, in a way, the way that we handled the pandemic was a pretty perfect illustration of badly thought through trade-offs. When we ended up doing economic lockdowns long after we should have acted to deal with the contagion, and I'm almost certain inflicted more economic damage than, than we did public health good. Uh, maybe our goal at Hoover should be to keep on reminding our colleagues at the new sustainability school that these trade-offs are central to the making of good public policy. And whether it's, whether it's a pandemic uh, or climate change, you can't come up with solutions that have such economically negative consequences that they're almost certainly politically not viable. And the Green New Deal document, if you look back on that uh, monstrosity, was a perfect illustration of a bad policy document that had it been implemented, would it, were it to be implemented, would completely shut down economic growth in the United States and probably condemn us to permanently depressed levels of unemployment. So I think that is- Gentlemen, I think that's a good place to wrap for this week. The powers that be are giving me the high sign. Uh, Professor Ferguson was right. This is the beginning of a 10 part lecture series, I think on Europe. And maybe if you wanna bring it up next week, there's a lot we didn't get into. We didn't talk about what the next generation of leadership is. We didn't really discuss how these attitudes changed. And we really didn't discuss how the United States is gonna approach Europe if indeed they're uh, at least ambivalent toward us or becoming more China centric. So maybe next week we'll continue gentlemen, but thanks for a lively conversation. So that's a wrap for this episode of Goodfellows. We'll be back a week from now, next Wednesday, with, well, maybe the same topic, but a new conversation. On behalf of the Goodfellows, Neil Ferguson, H.R. McMaster, John Cochran, all of us here at the Hoover Institution, we wish you and yours the very best. Stay strong, stay healthy, and we'll do our best here at the Hoover Institution to help you stay informed. We'll see you next week. I've seen one deer, uh, woodpeckers, rock chucks which are destroying the house from the ground up and yesterday for the first time we saw some elk of bears not a trace <laughs>